story is a little bit familiar to you, right? So you read about this great machine learning model, uh, a fly combinator, or a hacker news, or something like that. Maybe your boss reads it for you. And so you're a diligent data scientist, so you go, you pick up the paper, right? Get that model somehow, and you look at that math code, and you're thinking, you know, this is complex, but like, I definitely I get it, I rock it, right? And maybe you put together this experiment, you write 40, 50 lines of code, uh, and everything is working together, and then your boss says, okay, this is great, but. Oh my God. Can you hear me now? Much, much better. All right, so where we were was that our boss looked at our 40 lines of code that we were you know, inordinately proud of <laughs> and said, well, how do, I, how do we maintain this, right? What does it work in this condition? Or maybe we're not seeing the performance of the recommender that we thought we were going to get. And so after you spend all this time reading this paper, you finally go out and you do that Google search that you probably should have started with. And you're like, oh man, <laughs> this is actually already in a library. Um, and one thing that's great about the Python community and the open source data community is that if it's not in a library yet, it probably will be soon. So it's going to just be like a waiting game for your boss. And you notice that you know, this is in sort of an estimator form, right? And now that 40 lines of code that you had written becomes three lines of code, right? You import the model and you fit it, right? Uh, maybe you put some hyperparameters into it. And you're like, man, this is great. And you go into the documentation and you're like, heck, there's a ton more other models that are very similar to, to what I was doing. In this case, you know, the, this is maybe an older story about the Netflix prize with a recommender model using matrix factorization. But look at all these other tools that we can use to do decomposition. Or you know, maybe today we'd say in PyTorch, I want to use this temporal convolutional network. And then you go into the PyTorch documentation, and you see you know, CNNs and RNNs and LSTMs and different architectures. And you're like, oh man, there's all this stuff that I can try. And so now you are the hero, right? Your boss is like, this is awesome. We don't have to maintain it. Performance is great. We can build this into our applications, right? Everything is going awesome. And this is great news. And it's why I think that you guys are all here at this conference, right? That this makes it possible. And, you know, what I tell my students and, and what I know is that this is made possible by this API, right? This estimator API where estimators are objects that learn from data. And we might have transformers that apply mapping functions to our data that learn from data about how to routinely apply those transformations. Or we might have models that make predictions. We can put them together in pipelines. And we have a, a, a sort of a, a mechanism that the software engineering team also enjoys using. And I think it's natural when you look at this well, and, and one thing also, another great thing about this API is that that academic work that we saw at the beginning, that digging through the paper, translating lots of math, right? You can do that as a contribution, but generally speaking, the algorithmic design stays in the hands of academia, and they're really good at it, right? There's a lot of great transfer from university out to uh, the open source community, and then you get to be this wizard, right, when you apply it in your real work. And I think that the instinct is then to ask yourself, well, can I automate this workflow? And uh, you know, given the number of products that exist to automate this workflow, uh, you know, some of which have been presented at this conference, I think that this is like the natural instinct. And to a certain extent, you can formulate this as a search problem, a search problem composed of the model selection triple, right? We hypothesize that there exists some combination of features, right, an algorithm or model, and it's hyperparameters that modify the behavior of that model in the data space and in the model space that will perform the most effectively in the application that we're trying to put together. And that hypothesis is a strong hypothesis, and it's one of the reasons that we are, are professionally competent and that we can move forward. And it leads us down the road of stuff like this, uh, where we just grab our nice cross-validation library, right? 
we fit, uh, we do our Krefeld's cross-validation, we fit, we take the mean, right? We look for the best scoring model and we get into this mentality where it's like, just try them all, see what works. And you know, what I'd like to tell you is like, I'd like to say that this is what, you know, my students do, right? They don't know about these models, so they just try them all. But I am happy to admit to you, and I guess, you know, everyone in the world, uh, that I do this too, right? Like, if I am confronted with a data set that I've never seen before, I have no idea if there's a linear effect, a nonlinear effect. I don't know what's in it. So I'm very happy to spam like eight AWS extra large instances on just blowing away some search, right? Just to like get me in the right like neighborhood, right? In the right, right ballpark. But that story sort of hints at the overall problem. And that's that this search, play, search space is not only big, but also infinite, right? So if you even just ignore the feature set and the algorithm set, if you just look at the hyperparameters for a single model, right, your instinct to put a grid search together, even just for like a simple text analysis with just a two-step pipeline of vectorization and then, you know, an SGD classifier, some, uh, you know, stochastic gradient descent, your instinct is that as you increase this grid of these different combinations of hyperparameters, you don't, you're getting into this sort of exponential explosion of possibilities. And this is just one small corner of the algorithmic landscape. And so at this point, maybe you start to feel not so wizard because that earlier win that you got by reading this paper about the specific application and then bringing it to your data that fit in very well with the topic of the other paper, is maybe not so easily applied when you try to use it in, in different domains. Um, and so this talk is really about, well, what do we do when we find ourselves in that situation? And so the first thing to do is to admit we have a problem, and that problem is search, right? Uh, so, you know, long before the days of Google, if you said search in a computer science department, right, that would be the equivalent of saying untractable problem, unsolvable problem, right? Search is unsolvable. Uh, and that's true in this space too, right? It's very difficult in a high dimensional space, right? Which is our parameter space, this triple space that we're searching for. And even if you try to get fancy and use genetic algorithms or particle swarm optimization or really like cutting edge optimization techniques, there's no guarantee of a solution. You might end up with this very rugged error terrain that really there's no way to go one direction or another. You're just completely off in left field. You're nowhere close. And as this space gets larger, time increases exponentially. So uh, it's, it's certainly a problem and, it, and it's an unsolvable one. However, if we stop thinking of search as a brute force, force approach, and we start to think about how we can peek under the hood, we can use this second observation that even when you're in a search land and it's very difficult, that if you can see the data, you can gain a much stronger intuition about what's happening, right? So this is Anscombe's Quartet. It's very famous, right? These four data sets have the same mean, standard deviation, linear regression, um, uh, variance, and, but they all have very different shapes, right? It could be outliers, but when you see it, you intuitively understand it. So the idea is that instead of just wandering randomly through this search space, what we're going to do is we're going to steer our model selection using a visual analytics approach, right, where through the medium of data visualization, our models communicate with us, right, and we guide them into the right place. And so it's good news, right, because A, it keeps us in a job, right, there's no automatic machine learning, because if there was, like, we wouldn't have to have these conferences and, and get to come down to Miami from DC, which is, you know, really great weather, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, and, but at the same time, we can actually meaningfully, meaningfully influence our workflow. Um, and so that's largely what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk today. So I'm going to do that through this lens of the Yellow Brick Library. Yellow Brick is a NumFocus affiliated open source project. And just full disclosure, I'm uh, one of the core contributors. And Rebecca, who will be giving a talk tomorrow, is also one of the core contributors uh, for Yellow Brick. Um, but what I want to do is I want to start to get into some of the visual diagnostics and visual um, sort of uh, uh, tools that we can use to, to look at this machine learning workflow. And it's probably simplest to simply frame that according to the model selection triple. 
So let's first look at visual feature analysis, right? What can we do with visual feature analysis? So in the common case, I think that we're all fairly used to exploratory data analysis, right? Violin plots and box plots, histograms, joint plots, KDEs, all that good stuff, doing EDA. Um, but when you're in the machine learning land, right, what you're gonna end up with is 70, 90, hundreds of features, right? And then you get all of these mappings that you can apply to your features to transform them and extract different feature representations. And so it's not such a simple EDA problem. Instead, the question really is, what is the minimal set of features that's going to most meaningfully affect my model overall? And that's what feature analysis in a visual, like in the machine learning context uh, requires. So I think that the easiest thing to do is instead of looking at individual features, we wanna look at them all at once, all at a time. And so that's where these rank features visualizations come from. So we have rank 1D and we have rank 2D. And the idea is for one dimensional, you take one feature and you compare it and you look at it, right? Is it, does it have a uniform? Is it more uniform than the other distributions? Is it more normally distributed than the other distributions, right? How many potential outliers or hapaxes are there? Uh, and you get this rank. And what it does is it helps you target in and zoom in and figure out, well, what should I be creating a histogram for? You know, what should I be creating box plots for so that I can actually meaningfully investigate this data? Um, you can also think, how do these features correlate with my target variable if you're in a supervised context, right? So you can rank your features according to mutual information or a correlation with your target variable. And so you can say, what is most predictive, right, given the data set that I have? Now, we can extend that to two dimensions, and the reason that we do this is because we note that collinearity and covariance can be a big problem, right? The effect that two features have on each other might be a big problem in our models. And so we wanna see if we can sense that. And you know, true independence between our features is, is just, it's not possible, right? Um, I don't think we ever really strive for that. But we wanna at least minimize the amount of independence. And so we do pairwise ranking of our features, right? So instead of a bar plot, you have this heat map, right? Where you can compare the correlation coefficient or the covariance or you know, the least squares area and a, uh, error on a simple regression, the mean squared error, Maybe there's nonlinear uh, correlation, so we could look at quadracity or some other things. And what you start to note is that when you start to do this dynamic analysis with two different ranking mechanisms, you start to see different areas of interest, right? So when we're looking at Pearson, right, there's some clear, very high correlation variables here, but covariance, the region of interest, is, is up here. And so that allows you to get a better intuition of how those features are interacting with each other. And then you can zoom in and do the joint plots and uh, the different types of analytics and exploratory data analytics that you're used to. So it's really about filtering that high dimensional sort of space into something that you can meaningfully grok. This leads us to our sort of second area, which is when we're creating models, we usually have two primary goals, right? We want a generalizable model, right? We don't want to overfit it, but we also want a model that's separable. We need to choose the features that create distinct predictive regions, and there needs to be some separability. And when you're in a high dimensional space, like how do you do that with you know, high dimensions when you can only really visualize with say seven dimensions, right? Maybe you have two axes, maybe three axes, color, size, shape, right? You don't have a lot of visual aids to draw that many dimensions. So how do you see this? So one very good approach from the genomics world is to use radial visualization. So what you can do is you can plot the features around the unit circle, around the outside of the unit circle, and then you can sort of think of these points as dropped in the middle and pulled to the outside based on the strength of that feature uh, uh, in that direction. And you know, what you can sort of see here in this two-class problem of if using sensors, if a room is occupied or unoccupied, you can see that there is a clear separability between these two classes. That hints that with this feature set, a binary classifier is going to be effective at working on this data, right? So this is good news for us. And with a circle, I mean, technically, you can fit an infinite number of features around the circle, um, but you do get into some issues, like, you know, if two features with approximately the same magnitude are on opposite sides of the circle, then the point won't move, right? It'll just be stuck in the middle. 
Um, and so by playing with this visualization, changing the order of features, trying to maximize the white space, just that dynamic behavior gets you a lot of intuition and a lot of feeling about what's happening inside of the data. An alternative to radial visualization is to do things in a horizontal fashion, to unfold that circle so that we have uh, multiple vertical axes right along the horizontal, and our instances are drawn as line segments uh, across each of them. And so we're doing the same thing in this visualization as we were doing before. We're looking for braids or cords of connected uh, data. We can see that you know, with CO2, there appear to be two distinct clusters of uh, unoccupied data, but that it's more variable with the occupied data. Um, and so you can really get that intuition. And the same thing, right? Reordering the axes and filtering outliers, right? You can do all of that work inside of this visualization, right? It's very clear what's happening in this. But one of the really neat things about parallel coordinates is you can inspect the effect of normalization. We have a problem in this visualization, and this problem also exists in our modeling, and that's that the magnitude of the unit of CO2, which is measured in parts per million, is much higher than the magnitude of the units for relative humidity or temperature, right? And in, in many models, this might be a problem, and it's certainly a visual problem for us. So we can start to explore the effect that normalization has on our data set. Is it going to be, like, is L1 or L2 normalization going to be effective? Should we be using min-max, min-absolute? Should we be using something that uses a standard deviation in order to normalize or do some sort of standard, uh, standardization, right? Well, these are all options that we have in our feature extraction, um, but you can visually see the effect of that, and is this, are you still maintaining separability when you're applying these transformers to your data? Um, and that intuition is, is just so important as, as you move forward because you, I think that people make assumptions and a lot of those assumptions are based on what worked before, right? You go with the tools that you know worked before, but when you have that sort of visual instinctive ability to move forward, it gives you a, a much better way to sort of find that search space and find where you're going a little bit better. Now these two techniques, RADVIS and parallel coordinates, are high dimensional data visual techniques. Um, but sometimes we just want to scatter plot, and so we're going to want to do some sort of projection, right? We want to project from a high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space, and so one common method of doing that is PCA, do a principal component analysis down to two or three components. Um, and in this case, this is unsupervised, so there's no target variable embedded into this visualization. Um, but people who do a lot of PCA expect the biplot representation, right? What is the strength? of the original features in this component space, right? So, you know, are these guys more associated with the water in this model, the amount of water in this model, uh, versus the splast over here, right? So you can start to see that embedded inside of your visualization. Um, of course, PCA assumes a linear uh, relationship in the high dimensional space, and that's not always true. So we can also use manifolds and embeddings to use similarity or distance to embed uh, our data from the high dimensional space into the lower dimensional space. And these things, tools are also used as a pre-processing technique uh, in modeling, and so we wanna see that. So uh, Yellow Brick has a bunch of, of uh, manifold embedding using scikit-learn, so T-SNE, UMAP, ISOMAPS, LLE, uh, all sorts of stuff. And so here, you know, with a classification, we can see that clear separation, that clear discernibility using the manifold. But we can also do this with regression, right? Continuous uh, targets as well, using a heat map to see are there clusters of high value regions versus low value regions? Do we think that a low order polynomial is actually going to fit this data better based on the embedding? Or are we gonna have to simply turn to a nonlinear model um, just because that's the only thing that we'll be able to do, right? So again, that intuition guiding that model search uh, and that model tuning. So, from that sort of feature analysis, I think you put yourself into a nice little space uh, where you have this really good, more intuitive, better understanding of your features. Certainly a better understanding than you would if you had just like dumped off a 36 hour search job and gotten a table full of numbers, right? Uh, you have that, so the question then is like, how do we take this visual analysis and move it into our models? So the first thing is we want to select the minimum set of features to fit our models on, right? So we know that uh, models have a trade-off between bias and variance. 
uh, error injected due to bias and error due to variance, and that the, the trade-off is based on this idea of complexity. The more complexity you have in your model, the more overfit your model is, the higher your error due to variance. The simpler your model, the more underfit it is, the higher your error due to bias, right? So there's this trade-off. So adding features adds complexity. So we want the smallest set of features that is predictive. So if many models, but if your model has a COFs underscore or a feature importances, then we can start to plot that, right? And we can see the relative feature importances. What is contributing the most information to this model? And maybe that allows us to eliminate some. If you have a, a two-dimensional uh, feature importances, like in logistic regression, you can see the importance to a specific class, right? So maybe for class zero, right, the blue, really this, you know, feature two is the most important, um, but all four features are contributing to class two, right? And so it gives you that understanding. Now you're gonna wanna do the natural thing, right? And you're gonna wanna eliminate the lowest or least important features to see if that enhances your model. So, but you also wanna visualize that process. So this is recursive feature elimination. So at every step, we eliminate the least informative feature and we keep doing it until we either run out of features or, or some upper bound. And if you just do this using the automatic RFECV that's in scikit-learn, it's gonna tell you that 19 features is going to perform the best. But if you guys look at this visualization, probably you guys are thinking, well, that, <laughs> you know, that, maybe that's the best, but it's really not better than 18 or 17 or 21, right? Because we look at the variance, right, of the cross-validation on these curves. And if we are truly looking for the most minimal set of features, then really 10, 11, or 12 features is going to be better. It's going to be a better model using that metric of the minimal feature set than the 19 uh, feature set is going to be. So those visual tools aid you in, in figuring that out. Uh, speaking of cross-validation, uh, you, you, know, you can have visual quick checks, right? So are my trained test splits equally balanced inside of the class? Is my cross-validation highly variable, right? This is an extremely variable cross-validation across different splits, right? Do I have something in my data? Outliers, bad data, missing data that's causing some of my cross-validation splits to fail, right? So you can use these as simple checks. Then, of course, you can get into the model-specific uh, evaluations, right? So for regression, we have prediction error plot and residuals plot. So the prediction error plot plots y hat versus y, so you're hoping that your data is normally distributed along a 45 degree line. Or you can just plot the straight up residuals because I don't know about you guys, but mean absolute error or mean you know, square error or RMSE doesn't mean a whole lot to me, right? But when you look at the error of the residuals across your model, you, know, you, you learn, you intuit things very quickly. So for example, do we have heteroscedasticity in my model, right? Is, is this thing better and more variable in one area of my target than another? Am I erring higher or am I erring lower than the target, right? This can dramatically inform what model you select depending on what your requirements are. Of course, for classifiers, we can immediately just visualize classification reports and confusion matrices, guiding your eye to exactly the hotspots where you wanna look, but it also facilitates model comparison, right? It's much easier to compare the heat map of a naive Bayes with a logistic regression or a multilayer perceptron than it is to just simply compare the numbers, right? Like what's the difference between 0.73 and 0.74, right? And sometimes that's, that's hard to get at. Uh, then you can dive even deeper with precision and recall and you can look at precision recall curves both in the binary or aggregate case, macro average case, or you can look at it in the multi-class case. You can carry that onto rock awk or threshold visualizations. Uh, if you're doing uh, binary classification or using different types of thresholding for queuing, right? To really get that feeling, like what is the relationship of precision and recall in, in my model? You know, my professor told me that there should be, an, you know, a trade-off between precision and recall, but is that real or not, right? In my experience, sometimes that's not real, and you just have a classifier that's just guessing, right? And, and can you see that at work? or getting into clustering models, right? So uh, looking at the silhouette scores, right? Do we have well-distributed, you know, approximately same density clusters? Do we have that bucket cluster that everything just goes into and lots of small clusters, what's happening? Or we can look at intercluster distance maps, right? So how far are these cluster centers from each other and how many points are in each cluster? And can we evaluate 
how well the clustering models are doing. Um, and finally, visual hyperparameter tuning, which you know, I know I'm running a little bit low on time, um, but we can look at sort of the model-specific hyperparameter tuning. So if we have regularization, is our L1 regularization actually having an impact, or, or is our features just bad, right? What is the alpha that's being selected for lasso versus elastic net, right? Is this actually making a meaningful difference? Or looking for the elbow in like a K-elbow visualizer, but also thinking about the time it took to fit these models, right? The larger the number of clusters, the longer time the k-means is going to take to fit, and that might be an important, as important a requirement as having dense, you know, uh, contiguous uh, clusters inside of our model. And then, of course, you can get into the validation and learning curves, right? Do I need more data, right? Or do I have a lot of redundant data using the learning curve to find out how many instances and is that actually impacting your model score? Or for single hyperparameter tuning, we know that you know, eventually you know, both train and test scores should go down together, but at some point we're gonna overfit and that, um, that training score should skyrocket and the test scores should fall. And so you know, what happens is you get this range. Well, I'm gonna do a grid search, but I'm going to search in this very valid range for this particular valid curve, validation curve rather than doing this sort of infinite search across all of my space. So hopefully with that, I've convinced you that adding these visual diagnostics uh, to your, your workflow really enhances the process. It steers you to the right model. And I think that potentially we all do this in our code. Certainly, you know, I have notebooks that have these like 30 to 50 lines of, of matplotlib and, and scikit-learn code in them. Um, and so I just want to say that really what Yellow Brick contributes is this idea of a visualizer, right? An estimator that learns from data to draw all of the visualizations that you just saw and more, right? So I, I've showed you nothing that wasn't in Yellow Brick. Everything was in Yellow Brick. And so that sort of code that you're continually copying and pasting, you know, becomes either this, right, where you take, you import the visualizer, you fit it and you score it and then you poof it, which, you know, adds a title and a legend and saves it to disk or, or makes it display using matplotlib.show. Um, or you can use the quick method, right, if you just want a one-liner to, to make this visualization happen and you don't want that sort of customization. Um, and I think that by having this, Right? You can immediately integrate this into your code. It's not an afterthought anymore. Right? You're creating these pipelines of data loading, transformation, estimator, right? and now you can just add in the feature visualization, add in the model visualization into these workflows, and when you have them at your fingertips, right, that's what creates a meaningful difference in your ability to steer towards the best model and to make you faster at your modeling, but also more effective at finding the most uh, performant, predictive, or correct things uh, that enhance your applications meaningfully. So you can go back to being that super fireman kid uh, when you're working with your boss. So um, with that sort of tour, hopefully uh, everyone is, is eager to try this out. Um, but I just want to sort of add uh, another component to this, and that's that Yellow Brick is an open source project, and you know, Honestly, if you use it, we would love to hear from you guys even on this, but another one of our goals is not only to enhance the model selection workflow, uh, but also to be the best place to contribute, right, uh, anywhere in the PyData community. And so to do that, you know, we have people, we respond quickly, we engage. We realize that when you're communicating over like GitHub issues, right, that text-based communication uh, can be lost. So we tend to go over the top with gratitude and positivity, right? Just to make it clear how welcome people are to contributing. So if you are interested in contributing to open source, I would strongly encourage you to consider contributing to, to Yellow Brick. But even if you're just interested, if you have an idea for a visualizer, like, hey, in my workflow, I do this, and here's my 30 lines of code, I don't have time to contribute. But if you go in and make a feature request for that, you know, we will be grateful, and that will absolutely meaningfully uh, contribute. Um, you know, the ideas and the workflow, I use this professionally in my workflow, um, but my workflow is different than your workflow, and so if you have an idea for something that would make your life easier, um, we would absolutely love to include it in Yellow Brick. And so that's it. If there's any time for questions. We got time for some questions. Sorry. 
after lunch. <laughs> So I have a quick question. So um, does the current uh, visualizers only apply to the models in sklearn, or can they apply to other packages? What a wonderful question. Uh, so we certainly designed this around the concept of the estimator in scikit-learn. Um, however, we have a contrib package that also is being used to extend this to other libraries. So in the contrib package, there's an, uh, an example of how you create a stats model uh, estimator for use in yellow brick. We have examples of how to do this in PyTorch and in Spark. Um, and we're definitely thinking about in the future how do we meaningfully contribute uh, visualizations, uh, the visualizers to those other libraries. So it's, it's definitely on the horizon and there's some examples now. Um, and it's usually pretty simple right out of the box so long as they have that scikit-learn API. You know, usually with just a little tweaking you can get these things to work. Thank you. Uh, thing, yeah, thanks for the talk. I know um, something that keeps coming up again and again as a big selling point for deep neural nets is that we don't have to do any of this feature engineering and somehow, you know, we just get everything for free with, with this black box. Um, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical of that idea, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering as far as with the, the bias, bias variance trade-off, if, if you have any, any words of wisdom as far as, you know, what what should I shoot for for a dimension of my space? I can feature engineer until the cows come home and have polynomial features and <laughs> blow up, you know, get a very high dimensional space and then I can do PCA or some kind of projections and, and go, you know, back and forth and like, would you say, you know, have people looked at doing like simulated annealing on this kind of thing to try to get like the right dimensional space or mm -hmm. I guess what's a, what's a good workflow for finding that? Uh, I, another... <laughs> That's a, yeah, you're not taking it easy on me, but uh, certainly a good question. I, you know, I, you know I, I do do deep learning uh, for, for time series data, and usually when I'm pulling out deep learning models, it's for functions that don't have a good approximation with the more conventional models. Um, but I will say that if interpretability, right, becomes important, which it absolutely is, for domain, like the medical domain and, and a lot of like domains that have risk associated with it, you really do have to have an understanding of what your features are. And you can't just say like, oh, it's these convolutions that are going into this pool. Like this is, you know, this is what this means. Um, uh, and so I am certainly a proponent of, of feature engineering. And, and I, you know, my experience has been that that is, you know, 70 to 90% of, of what you're doing because, you know, the reasonable defaults on the hyperparameters are, are effective so long as you have the right feature set. Um, and then these visualizations and visualizers enhancing that interpretability, enhancing your understanding, uh, really give you that basis for saying something meaningful about, about those features. Um, and you know, my use of this tool really is to figure out like where is the complexity in this model, right? Where is the, the place where I can turn the knob and I can really move the needle for bias and variance? Um, but I will say another place that this sort of crops up, and I'm perfectly happy using these things on the PyTorch model or, or some other model, but uh, a lot of times this actually comes up as a defense of having to use the deep learning model, right? Like, listen, I couldn't make, you know, gradient boosting or random forest or, you know, all of these, like, ensemble models. I just couldn't make it go on this particular problem. We haven't managed to, like, distill it correctly, but we do need something now. Let's throw a convolution at it and see if the convolution can pick up something that we just can't intuit based on, on what we're working with. Um, so, non-committal answer, but hopefully I didn't make anyone upset. <laughs> Time for one more. Nope. Okay, well, thanks again, Benjamin. Thank you.